Hey, that's the housekeeping and uh, welcome again. So I'm going to hand over now to Tristan. Um, take us through some very important things, Tristan. Thank you, Angela. Um, so today we're going to be thinking about monitoring and managing provision. And this uh, webinar is really aimed for new to post Senkos. Um, so that's not excluding anyone else, but that is where we're going to pitch it. So if you are not yet a Senko, if you're a teacher who's thinking about SEN, or if you're a, a very experienced Senko, or you're a school leader, or from another field, um, welcome also. Um, but if you have got questions there, it might be useful to indicate those matters, you know, your area, if you're not a new to post Senko. Um, so I just thought that's important to say that at the beginning, because we do get quite a wide range of people coming to these webinars. So in the webinar today, um, I want to cover the following things. So first of all, I think we need to start by thinking about what are the key principles that underpin um, a Senko monitoring and managing provision. And so if we're talking about provision, I think it's really important that we try to be clear about what we mean by provision and what we understand by that term provision, um, because that's important for us then to disseminate that understanding amongst others. And then also then going to think about why monitoring and managing provision is useful for a SENCO. Um, then I'm going to think about and talk to you about auditing your SEN provision as, as a, a starting point really. And then a key question from my work with Senkos is what about this provision mapping stuff? So I'm going to spend some time thinking about what a provision map can do, what it might be like, what its purpose is and how we go about drawing up a provision map. I then want to briefly touch on evidence informed practice and then finish off by thinking about the Senko as a leader and really bringing together the fact that monitoring and managing are leadership um, activities. So that's what I hope to cover in the next 60 plus minutes um, because we will be leaving, as Angela said, some time at the end for responses to your questions. So please do um, pop those questions in the Q&A or if you want, save them to the end. Um, and if you are experiencing any um, technical issues, we do have Mia who is online all the time there behind helping you to sort out any issues. So please do also pop that in the chat if you've got any problems, um, technical problems or other things that you'd like to um, sort out during the talk. And Mia will also be posting some links in the chat, I believe, as we go through um, that I might be referring to. I just want to then, before we really launch in, is just to remind you that this is a series, part of a series of webinars and blogs for new to post Senkos that um, myself and my colleague Angela and Linda and um, another colleague Katie have been um, producing for Whole School SND for you to access. So we have one webinar, which was about understanding and identifying areas of need. And the second webinar using the graduated approach and SEN support. So if you missed those, they are online. Um, there will be some are already online and they will be coming online for you to be able to watch. Um, and Mia's going to put some links in about those. And I would say that some of what I'm saying will assume um, your understanding and that you're already up to speed on areas of un identifying and understanding need and the graduated approach. And we also have um, three blogs which are already posted and one coming up um, again, which complement and work alongside the this webinar and the other webinars. Um, so, again, those are available on the SEND gateway. So please do take some time to have a look at those. I think they they could be useful to you as a new Senko as well. So first of all, let's think about the key principles for managing and monitoring provision. We need to start at that key guidance text, the Special Educational Needs and Disability Code of Practice. And that really is the area that all SENCOs need to get to know well. 
um, and need to know that because it guides what they should be doing and um, what they must be doing um, and it is really a key text so in what I've taken out from section 6.9 are four key points which indicate the responsibilities that Asenko has that I think are really relevant to this topic of managing and monitoring provision. So one of the Senko's roles is to oversee that provision that is happening, the day-to-day -day operation of your SEN policy in your setting. And the only way to do that is to be able to have a firm grasp. So that is monitoring what is going on. Then you need to manage that. You need to coordinate. It's in the name of the post. So these are two key elements that you have to be doing as a Senko. You also will be asked regularly to advise on how do I do this? How do I do that? How should we do that? So and informed by that graduated approach. So again, if you are able to have a really good view and understanding, if you monitor well, then your advice will be quality. So that's key. So managing and monitoring underpins that 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 approach. And then looking on a wider scale, that strategic development of SEND in your setting. So how do we use a budget? How do we use resources to meet the needs of the children and young people in our setting? Again, that is so informed by your managing and monitoring. So those, I think, are four things that we need to keep um, oversight of when we're thinking about managing and monitoring provision. So part of that, we mentioned the graduated approach, um, but it's something that I think is really, really important to keep emphasizing and to keep in our minds that anything that we're doing in terms of provision for children and young people, we need to make sure that we've assessed what's going on, that we've got a really good understanding, that then we plan for something, whatever we're going to do, what, however we might um, action, intervention provision for children and young people we make sure that what we plan is done and that can be a tricky step in the graduated um, approach and then we review and i think that's a key principle again to keep in mind all of the time um, and that we need to be monitoring that that sort of thing goes on that that approach is going on so again that's a key principle when we're thinking about monitoring and managing provision So we need to be secure when we're monitoring and managing that provision. We need to be secure, first of all, that we have identified and assessed the needs of our learners effectively. And that's been covered in our previous webinars that I highlighted to you before. But that's sort of a given in what we're thinking about today is that you've got that identification and assessment process securely in place. Another thing that we need to be mindful of, we need to remind ourselves of and we need to work because sometimes the systems that are in place don't necessarily support um, in the best way um, the facilitation of this is to make sure that the voice of the learner and their parents and carers are heard and actioned. So when we get down to that nitty gritty of trying to organize budgets and staffing and all of those sorts of things, it can be easy to forget the voice of the learner and their parents and carers. And that's something that is now enshrined in the code of practice and is, was a real driver behind the code of practice to really ensure that, that the voice of the learner and their families are, is strengthened. So that's something that, again, I want to say, Really, we need to try and keep that in our mind when we're thinking about how we manage provision. And the third thing is keeping um, in our mind that we want to achieve positive outcomes. That's why we're here. We want to achieve those positive outcomes for the children and young people we work with. So again, that's a given, but I think it's something that it's good to remind ourselves of and it's good to come together as a community who think, yeah, we are actually doing something that we think will have positive outcomes. So if we are going to monitor and manage provision, we really need to be clear about what we mean by provision. 
So I was reflecting, I guess, to myself, what is SEM provision? And I think we need to start with SEM provision being part of whole class teaching. Again, if I return to the SEN code of practice and every teacher is a teacher of SEN. So when we're thinking about SEN provision, it can be um, quite easy to slip in to thinking about interventions or work that we're doing um, on a small group scale, individual work. And we really need to keep in mind that whole class teaching is our first SEM provision. Again, differentiation, which takes place without necessarily drawing people away or adding an extra adult is something else that is an important part of our SEM provision. So again, when we're thinking about that, if we're talking to staff as a SENCO, then we need to really think, are we clear about differentiation? Do our staff have a clear understanding of what that means and how they might do that? So then, as I've mentioned, interventions that we might put in place for groups or individuals are part of our SEN provision. And then thinking that our whole environment, the learning environment is an SEM provision. Often teachers and TAs spend a long time creating an effective learning environment. And that's sometimes not recognized by themselves and by others. Um, the important influence that the environment can provide in terms of our learners who are identified with SEN. So learning walks and things like that as a SENCO can be really useful and is something that we need to consider in our provision. Playtimes. So if we look at some of the provision and some of the targets that I see, individual targets for learners with SEN, then playtime um, and lunch times, you know, those unstructured playtimes, um, unstructured times for those young people, those are often identified as areas for development, areas where they're targeted with some area to work on. So again, we mustn't forget that the provision that is in place or not in place during those unstructured free play times um, in mainstream settings, that's really an important thing to consider when you're looking at SEM provision. So lunch times, which I just touched on there, but I'm thinking about that time, um, at the moment, that might not be in a lunch hall, that might be in your classroom because of COVID bubbles. Um, but though that situation of sitting and eating together, again, is a really important area. We know that's an important area in terms of social and emotional learning. Um, but again, that can be something that is targeted for an individual learner. And some of the challenges and barriers to, for example, a noisy um, hall where lots of people are eating and then there's lots of buzz going on, that can be really difficult for some of our learners. And we might think, be thinking about how can we remove those barriers. And as such, that is part of our provision that we're offering. Again, those out of curriculum area times such as breakfast clubs and after school provision, which again, um, I have often seen as being part of targets, individual targets for learners. Um, so again, we might want to be considering that as part of our SEN provision. The important aspect of trips and visits. So there's a lot that we can talk about, about the benefit of learning outside the classroom and learning away from our school site. Um, so when we're organizing trips, we often have to be involved in making sure that we remove some of the barriers to participating fully in those trips and visits. So again, if we're thinking that they might hold barriers and we're thinking that these things are educationally valuable, then trips and visits are part of our SEM provision. And then overarching all of that, I would argue that our ethos towards our school, towards our children and young people is part of our provision and it underpins what we do, but also where we could say that it is a tangible thing. So when I talk to people who go and visit numerous schools, 
they often say I walk into a school and I can feel the ethos I can sense that ethos as soon as I walk in and if that can be taking place for adults then I'm sure that the children and young people um, will feel that as tangibly and I know that so many practitioners do work on ethos and values with the, the children and young people they work with so again I think that not only underpins our SEM provision but it is part of our provision we do training events where we might seek to um, support teachers and TAs to come together to discuss values um, uh, around our practice so again I think if we're putting in those things we need to recognize that as provision so overall I'm making the case that provision is a very very wide-ranging thing Tristan can I just yeah. perhaps pick up on on one issue that's been raised by Rachel Bowman um, and that's just mentioning uh, the before and after school provision that you've put in there um, and just talking about costing it on provision maps is that something that um, I mean, Rachel has, has, has talked about it being costed by local authorities on provision maps, but I guess we're talking about just the general costing of, of this in provision maps and being able to link with staff to, to look at the effectiveness and the impact. And any thoughts on, um, on that? Yeah, I think those can be quite difficult, can't they, depending on how they are funded. But I think, therefore, if if we are as a, if you as a setting are funding that breakfast club, then I think that that's perfectly reasonable for then. And, and if that's something that's in, that's included in a target for a young person who's on your SEN register, then I would say that it's perfectly reasonable to then include that as part of the cost for your SEN provision. Um, however, if it is an after school provision where um, it's payable, so you're bringing in an outside provider to do a football club and you've got a child who um, it's decided that they need to access extracurricular provision and they'll be given priority, let's say, to access that over and above others if there's a high demand, then um, when you're doing her provision map, if you are doing an individual provision map, um, you may not be able to cost that, but it still is provision, but there's no cost to the school. Then you'd say there's no cost because that's directly um, from, you know, paid by the families. So I think it depends on your arrangements. But I think if if that's something that the school is paying for and that it's included as an area which can support them in developing whatever um, array, arriving at whatever target you're setting for them, then I think it's perfectly reasonable. Thank you. Good question. Thank, thank you, Tristan. So then I think we also, if we're thinking about who we are monitoring and managing, um, that's an important question. So again, clearly it jumps to our mind that teachers, teachers are all teachers of SEN, that they are somebody who is providing this provision. And our teaching assistants, LSAs, whatever, however we might, um, whatever terminology we use, are another part really important part of the team who are providing that provision then we might also have in place somebody that we call a mentor or something similar and again though they may not be seen by some as educators they are providing part of a holistic education so we need to really ensure that we are have some way of monitoring um, the input that they are giving. SMSAs, your lunchtime supervisors, school meal, midday supervisor assistants, I think that's what that stands for. Um, again, those uh, individuals who work with our young children and, uh, and our young people, often given a really daunting task of being out on a playground, um, two of them being out on a playground with 120 young people. Um, so they've got a really, really difficult task, but they interact with those children on the school grounds um, as part of the school day. So, again, I think we really need to make the case that these people are people who are part of our SEM provision. 
And that provides challenges for SENCOs in terms of um, being able to include SMSAs in trainings and briefings. And how do you do that when often they are people who are working multiple jobs and they can't stay around after the lunchtime or they're off to do another thing. So that can offer us challenges, but I think it's something that we really need to consider as SENCOs. And then I'm also saying that those staff who work in our offices in our settings can be part of our provision. So again, I've seen individual targets where um, there is a target for a young person to go and visit Mrs. So-and-so who works in this area of the school on a daily basis as a job because that helps to develop their purpose, sense of responsibility, etc. And those are the people who often are the front line and support parents and young people when they're struggling. So I think, again, we might need to consider whether they are part of our provision. Um, again, that's a challenge, but I think it's a challenge that we need to consider deeply. Similar to that, site staff. So again, I've seen targets to go and do leaf sweeping with the caretaker on a Friday afternoon. Um, and, and again, that can be really important to some young people. So again, we might need to monitor that. I'm also questioning, this is a question, whether parents are part of our provision. So if we're thinking about working in collaboration with um, parents and carers, then do we need to see them as part of our SEM provision? And where does that line stop? And I think that's a quite a difficult issue. Um, so I'm just posing that as something just to prompt some thinking in your minds, but not necessarily to address it any further today. So why monitor and manage provision when you're a SENCO? So I've just got here two of those key points from the code of practice that I highlighted at the beginning. So for me, the key thing is that as a SENCO, in order for you to be able to function effectively, you need to know what is going on in your school. So at times you will need to tell people what is going on. You will be asked maybe by school leaders, maybe by external services such as an educational psychologist, by parents when you're discussing um, an individual or a group of individuals, you will need to be able to say, well, this is what's happening. That this child is being supported and they're having this level of support and this is how it goes on. Um, so you need to know that to be able to have informed conversations with those people who are invested in the learning of those children and young people. You then also need to know what's going on because you will have points where you are asked on an accountability level to talk about what's going on. So that might be in your report to school governors. That might be that you've got a visit from Ofsted. That might be that you're reporting to your school leaders, but there's a number of layers of accountability um, for you as a SENCO. So therefore, if you know what's going on, then you can confidently address those accountability points in your work. And finally, if you want to, as I said before, you want to make a positive difference for those learners. And if you know what is going on, then to know is to gain some power and you can be empowered to actually make positive changes and positive moves. And those are informed because you know what is going on. So I want to feel like a Senko in control. I think that's a point where I got as a Senko when I felt that I had monitoring and managing reasonably under my belt. I had a good grasp of that. I felt like a Senko in control. So what does that mean? What did I know about? I knew about the skills and attributes of the staff that I were monitoring and uh, that I were monitoring and that I was managing. I knew about what was going on in terms of quality first teaching. I knew what sort of timings and smart targeting was going on. 
And by monitoring, what I found was that smart targeting wasn't something that the teachers in one of my settings were particularly confident with. So I could take control as a Senko by then looking at some CPD that I put in place to make sure that people really understood smart targeting. And that I felt that once I was in control, I could look and understand those holistic outcomes. I think that if we don't feel in control as Senkos, then what we often are forced to do is to catch up by trying to find out little things that are going on. But if I can take that whole monitoring overview, then I can take a much more holistic view of the practice that's going on in my setting. And again, going back to that auditing, if I audit, then I'm ready for that accountability. So I can feel in control if I know those things and I've got those things under my belt. And then they really support me being able to advise on individual support and strategic support for SEN. So then I can make a difference. And again, I'm going to remind us, and I'm just gonna to touch in on that because it's easy to forget that we're all here to make a difference and how important that is and how valuable the work that you do is. And that's why I'm sort of emphasizing that because you do make a difference. So before, or when we're starting as a new Senko to monitor and manage, we might be picking up a monitoring system that a previous Senko has put in place. Um, but it's often the case that um, we pick up something that might not work for us or we pick up a situation where things haven't been working great and so that um, that monitoring isn't necessarily evident to us. So I think you're a lucky Senko, um, new Senko, if you pick up um, a monitoring approach that um, is still running right up to the point and if you get that time for a handover. So often as a Senko you don't necessarily get that. So I think that as such, an audit can be a really useful way to start as a new Senko. So you can get a really clear overview of the SEN provision. So you can look at what improvement has taken place. You can look and find out about what those staff skills and attributes are. You can audit to find out what the CPD needs are. You might audit to find out what resources do we have for our um, SEN provision. And just thinking some of that, um, it might involve, we use this computer program. How many licenses do we have? When were they last looked at? Because we've upgraded our IT suite or our IT provision. And actually we don't have provision for that many um, workstations, for example. So overall, when you're auditing, you're trying to work out not only what is going on, but what is working well and what is not working well or not working so well. So to do an audit, you could say, right, I'm going to go off and use some time to find out those things myself. And I might just make a list of the things that I want to know and go through and conduct that audit myself. Or I might use something some resource that is available that I'll talk about in a minute. You might want to use your wider network. So you might find that there is somebody within your local authority, if you're in a maintained school or within your multi-academy trust, um, where there is somebody who can come in and do that as part of the wider organization and the wider support network in for your setting. Or you might not a, not have that option or B, want to look at something more independent and you might consider bringing in an external body. So if you're thinking about that, I would say, first of all, I'm just going to give a plug to a whole school SEND um, publication, the Senko Induction Pack, which does talk about SEN audits. And there are a number of resources on the SEND gateway that can support you in approaching an audit. Um, and Whole School SEND have some other publications which offer you some formats for auditing SEM provision. So those are things you might want to consider. And I would also think that if you're considering an external body, 
be aware that there are a number of different external bodies and make sure that you're making an informed choice about who you bring in. So there are some independent consultants who will come in, who work for themselves, who will come in and do an SEM review for you. There are consortia of um, both local authorities and schools and other organisations who might have a real history of working in that advisory capacity, who you might think maybe they can offer me something different. Or you might consider some universities I know also offer um, SEND reviews. So I think don't think that if you're looking externally, you need to go to this jazzy website um, that offer that. I would say look around at all the different structures that are available and do talk to other SENCOs to find out what they've found uh, useful in terms of auditing. So going to talk about provision mapping now. Um, so as part of your monitoring of SEM provision, provision mapping is something that I've found again in my discussions with SENCOs um, is quite a complicated issue and an issue where there are lots of questions. So let's start at the basics. What is a provision map? It is something that offers you that overview, not only of what you is being put in place for the SEN provision for your learners, but also what the outcomes are of what is what provision is put in place. So for me, it is a tool. Again, that's going back to that being in control and being in control by having the knowledge. It's a tool for you as a Senko to understand what is going on in terms of SEN in your setting. So like I said before, it's a tool for you to be able to be in control. And therefore, it's a tool for you to be able to improve provision. It's also something that is really useful to share in a number of situations. So for some of you, you might find that a local authority requests part of that provision map to um, justify a request for funding. You will find that, um, again, when if you're going through that accountability time with your governors or with your school leaders, that it's something that you actually share. And often, if you've got an advisory teacher coming in, they will find it really useful when they're talking about provision that um, might be you might be considering for a young person, then you can share that provision map. And it really helps them to understand the direction that you're taking as a SENCO in your setting. So just bringing this up to remind us um, that in the code of practice, the DFE have said that provision maps are efficient. And so it raises that expectation that you will have a provision map. And I guess I'm sharing this because again from my experience of working with new Senkos um, a number of them have said well we don't have when I moved in to take on the Senko role we don't we didn't have a provision map I wasn't aware we really needed that so it's not mandatory but what it says in the code of practice is that it's efficient and it's a good way basically so I would encourage all of you if those aren't something that you have in place as a new Senko that's something that you need to really seriously consider and again, I think that when we are constructing our provision map, we need to go to teachers and we need to raise, we should, they should have that expectation that they provide the information for these provision maps. It's not up to the Senko to have to dig and dig and dig and to find out all the information for a provision map. Because teachers are responsible for the progress of their pupils in their class, including those pupils with SEN, then they should have that information. And if they're doing intervention groups or they've got an external person coming to work with them, the teachers should still retain that overview. Tristan, can I just yes. pick up on a comment uh, and or a question from Ashling that relates directly to that? 
Um, and you've you've partly answered it, but let me read the let me read the question anyway. Does the Senko have to complete the provision map for a child, or can the class teacher create one and update as provision changes? Then uh, we do the costing and checking. Thank you. Um, so I think you, there's a little. Well, I guess it's not a grey area. It's an area that is open for you as the Senko and your school to decide. So provision maps don't you, one doesn't necessarily have to have an individual provision map for each child now for a child where you are um you have a high level of intervention i suggest that that might be useful but we don't need to have individual provision maps um so there's lots of different models and i'll talk about this a bit more um but i'm i'm pick it up now because i think it's relevant there are models of provision maps for classes for year groups and whole school provision maps. And in terms, I'm, I'm just thinking there about SEN. So it might be that as a Senko, you might find that you think it is reasonable and useful to ask for your teachers to provide a provision map for their class. And that can feed into your whole school SEN provision map. I would think again that's by arrangement and agreement in terms of the detail uh, i would suggest that i don't think it would necessarily be i wouldn't expect when i was a senka i wouldn't have expected to ask the teacher to do the costings i would expect that to be part of my role to understand what the budget for sen is to understand how we might um provide um, or how we might cut out the budget for each of those things. So I don't think that the costing we would, I wouldn't expect the teacher to do that. I would expect that where you are going to start costing, I would expect that to be done by the Senko. So hopefully that answers your question, but I will come on a little bit more to discuss that as we go on. Um, I like these difficult questions. It's great where you, you can't give a straight answer, but I think that's important to know that we don't have straight answers for all of these things. And to me, that's about discussing A, with your leadership and B, with your wider team and making sure that we agree what's reasonable, what's doable um, and what's not doable. Um, so I think this graphic is a useful graphic. So this is a piece of work that the DFE did um, eight years ago now on provision mapping sadly it didn't really come to the fruition that all of us were hoping that it would in giving us some really clear guidance around provision mapping um, but there's a whole lot of work behind this that looks at questions that we might ask but i think that again that informed choices and making a difference um, they phrase it as ma maximizing impact that's central to why we're doing this provision mapping and I think that I'm really, I'm not going to work round these, um, each of these points, because I think we've covered um, all of these really um, within what we've been talking about. But I think this might be a useful graphic for you to think about and have as a reminder. So let's just check then on what we might want to improve in our provision mapping. So what's going on in quality first teaching? So again, if I'm sharing my SEM provision with an external body or a stakeholder, then I think if we miss off quality first teaching from our provision map, then we're doing a disservice to our provision. So I think it's something we need to remember to include. And I know that I didn't always include that and thought it was a given, but have you know, we're speaking with people about my provision maps and that, that it isn't a given. Um, so we need to make sure that again, we emphasize that it is part of a graduated approach. So we are working, we are assessing, and that this forms part of our graduated approach because it gives us the information when we've got that um, review part, we're pulling that review and we're putting that into the provision mapping. How did this piece of work that we were doing with these young people, how did that impact? Was it actually reaching um, the outcomes that we wanted? So it's part of that. And we're pulling from our review of provision and putting that into our provision map. So we need to include 
parts of those smart targets that we set for our individual learners or our groups of learners and include those in the provision map. So if we're getting that approach to setting those learners targets right in the first place, it makes the work of the Senko pulling together that provision map more straightforward. We also work within the context of school improvement and our leadership team. And if you're on that leadership team, great. But if, and if you're not, the leadership team will be deciding on the current focus for school or foci for school improvement. But that's an influence. It's going to um, actually um, work. Your, your SEM provision is going to work within that school improvement focus. So that needs to be acknowledged in the provision mapping that this is part of our school improvement focus. What your provision mapping will also address, and this might not be something that explicitly goes on the provision mapping, because this could be something that's confidential, um, is the training needs that this highlights. But where you have put training in, um, you know, that's really important. If you can reference that in your provision map, where you've got a highly trained um, HLTA who might be um, an emotion, an ELSA, an emotionally lit, emotional literacy support assistant, that can be really relevant to understanding that provision. Um, it can then address your funding needs because if you're costing that, you know what the budget is that you're coming out with that you're spending on SEN, and therefore it can be something that you can go to the budget holder and say look we've got these needs this is what we're spending at the moment this is what's working can we do some more this is how much it's going to cost and again it addresses as i've said before those accountability needs because you can take it to people and show them this is what we do and this is what works and this is what's not working so well and we're going to do something about that so it's not just a list we need to make sure that our provision map does have again I'll, I'll bang on about that that review part so it's not about saying it's all working brilliantly it's about showing that you are reflecting as a setting on that provision that you have in place and Ofsted said um, just pulled this out that an example of a good approach a good practice was um, to have provision map and that did contribute effectively and again, they talk about that being shared with parents and pupils as well and local authority. So it helps all stakeholders. I think it can be a really useful tool with all stakeholders. So I've just pulled out some images of different provision maps that I've encountered. Some of these towards the bottom, these are online provision maps and that they integrate with SIMS or SITS or any of the other systems that we have in our settings. Others are using databases that don't integrate and some are paper-based and word-based, you know, Microsoft Word-based. Um, so there's a range of different provision maps that I've seen and heard people make work for them. So what should it look like then? And I'm going to say whatever works for you and your stakeholders. I don't think that there is a way that we should say, we say that I can say that anyone should say this is what your provision map should look like. So, like I said before, you might want to have provision maps for a class, provision maps for a key stage, provision maps for a whole setting, all three, two of three. So, again, what works for you? And I think it's also important to say that this is a working document. Um, now that presents challenges because we need to take some snapshots at times. So paper based probably isn't great anymore because you can update something that's um, computer based. But as I said, having something that is in a Word document that is updated, that's changed, I would suggest changes, dating those carefully keeping those dates in your headings and in the file names is really useful if you're not working from an online version. So we want to include additional and different provision. You know, that's our baseline for whether, you know, this is SEM provision, do they need additional and different? What the outcomes are or the targets for that provision, 
which pupils are accessing the provision. So that can be a little bit tricky in that if we're going to share this document, we're also trying to identify pupils as well. So we may want to put in place something where we can anonymize or we use initials, but I'm not terribly, I wasn't terribly comfortable about using initials because I think they're still identifiable. So we might want to have a way of redacting certain points, but we need to be able to access um, when uh, at times who those groups are. So we need to identify who the pupils are and how those pupils are grouped. So it can be really useful if we know that they're also pupil premium children or sorry, they're also children who are in receipt of pupil premium um, and perhaps if they're children who are looked after. So again, some of those groupings can be really useful to also include on our provision map. We need to include how they're being staffed or resourced in other ways. Um, you know, so are we paying for a license? For a computer program or are we um, booking a room for them to access once a week um, so it might be staffing or it might be other resources have we bought in some particular resources and that cost us but we know that that's not going to cost us the same next year because we've got that resource we need to include the dates and the timings and the frequency of that provision again that helps us and we need to have a brief overview of what strategies are used. And so that hopefully you can have a shorthand for that. So it might be that you're using a particular program, then you just need the name of the program. It might be that it's um, focused on social emotional learning. Um, so again, some sort of shorthand for the strategies. And key, we need to know what the outcomes are. Now, I would argue that doesn't have to be those academic age related um, outcomes that can be but also you might have other outcomes that you have on your um, targets for those young people but you need to again those outcomes need to link to the intended outcomes at the second bullet point and then you need to work to the costings of that now if you're fortunate enough you might be part of a mat or a local authority where you have a ready reckoner so you can work out um, costings but in my experience if you're not it's really useful to um, make contact with the person in your setting who deals with the accounts and just find out what is an hourly rate with on costs for um, one of my teaching assistants for a teacher for a Senko for and I think that can be really useful because you can then say well it's three and a half hours and it's not this much that my TA's paid it's this much which is with the on costs so I think that's a really useful thing to have um, in your toolbox as a Senko so if we are um, managing that provision so we've monitored it and we're looking at it and we've got a provision map in place, um, then we're able to monitor what's going on. If we're doing that, then we're going to make decisions about what practice, what improvements we want to make. And so if we're choosing to change provision, choosing to develop provision, if we're within that assess plan do review and in that um, review part, we're thinking this isn't working for the young person. What do we need to put in place? I think that evidence informed practice is really, really important. So what does that mean? That might mean that you go and read stuff. It might mean that you use your networks to find out what's working for them. And I'm not going to say any more about that, but I'm just flagging up to you that um, early in, in next year, there will be two further webinars, one focused for primary school practitioners around evidence informed practice and research informed practice, and one for secondary practitioners. So do watch out um, for that. And hopefully you will like to come back, would like to come back um, to join us um, for those webinars as well. So as I said, um, Leadership is part of, is, is an activity. Um, monitoring managing is an activity of leadership. So the Senko is a strategic leader because 
you're monitoring and managing provision, you're advising people, you're planning and you're supporting. To me, those are leadership activities. And again, thinking about Senkos I've talked to, thinking about when I was a new Senko, I was, my reaction when somebody said, oh, well, you're taking a leadership position, even though I wasn't on the senior leadership team was, I'm not a leader, I don't wanna be a leader. I don't know, I can't lead, but actually it's the thing that we do. It's the thing that everyone is a leader, really. Everyone makes those decisions about, everyone plans and supports and advises, and we monitor and manage our own practice as a teacher. So it is a leadership role, and it takes you into that strategic leadership because you're thinking in a wider, with a wider framework. So you do make operational decisions. You are accountable and underpinning all of that for me key is that you have a vision and ethos so again i'm touching back to that wanting to make a difference for all of those young people and wanting to make a positive change for perhaps some of those young people who you've seen marginalized so i think that this graphic brings together um, again that notion that strategic leadership for a senko is about that identifying, tracking and assessment, being able to have an overview of high quality teaching and all of the things that go behind that. So that's not just quality first, but that's all of the interventions, all of the educational, um, their educational environment for those children and young people. And what we do then is find ways to remove those barriers to those marginalized young people, to those people who find learning difficult for whatever reason it is. And that's within that framework, the SEN framework and the laws and guidance that we have in place and our own policies enacted through regular review and evaluation, that monitoring and managing, making those decisions. And I guess the difference when you get to be the Senko from being a class teacher without those um, leadership responsibilities is that you are making decisions for other people. And so you can choose the way in which you do that. And you might want to think about how do I want to enact my leadership? But that is for another webinar. But because we are, as Senkos, making those decisions about provision, about what staff are doing, how they're doing it, who's going to be doing it when and where, and what's worth trying, what's not worth trying. Have we got the budget to do that? That strategic overview is something that aligns with senior leadership. Um, so as it says in the code of practice, it is most effective if you can be part of the school leadership team. Now we're in a situation at present where it's not mandated that SENCOs are part of the leadership team. But in order to monitor and manage provision effectively, I would argue that if you can, that would be a really useful place to gain access to. But as we know from the Senko workload survey, only, and this is borne out by a lot of other research, approximately 50% of Senkos are part of the schools of their school senior leadership team. So if you are part of the other 50% who aren't on the senior leadership team, how can you make sure that one, you can know what's going on? So you need to have an ear. How do you know when they're gonna make this decision? And right, we're gonna change our, we've got a new area for school improvement. And if you don't know that as a Senko early on, then when you're planning that provision, it's not gonna take that holistic approach. So how do you make sure that you've got an ear to what's going on and going to come out from the senior leadership team? And on the other side, if you're not part of the senior leadership team, how do you make sure that they listen to you? How do you make sure that they hear what the needs are in terms of SEN in your setting? Um, so I'm saying, is there a case that you can go and find and make a really strong case for being part of the SLT. And if you feel that that's not gonna work for you in your setting, then it's about trying to work out a way to get an ear and a voice. And it may be that it could be useful again to network with other Senkos to see how they've made that work. 
or the case that they can make. So, thinking, what have we covered today? Hopefully, um, those key principles are already embedded within your thinking as a SENCO, that it's not just a SENCO who is responsible for SCN. The SENCO is responsible for overseeing, advising, and strategically considering how SEM provision is enacted in your setting. That the graduated approach is key to all, all that we do. And that voice of the learner and their family. We've talked about SEM provision, how you might know what is good, what is part of that, and then how you might know what is good in your setting and where you might need to develop. We've talked about leadership, and we've talked about provision mapping, not in that order, I hasten to add. Um, and I've made that point that if you manage and monitor effectively, that can really empower you. So what are your next steps as a Senko? I would say don't do this on your own. If you're a new Senko, it's a challenging role and it's a challenging step up often for lots of us. So find your alliances, find other Senkos. Are there networks that you can join? If you enroll for the National Senko Award, then you will find not only will you have all of that learning to do with the National Senko Award, but you'll have a whole new network of people who are in a similar boat to you. And a number of my students who carry out, who take the Senko Award, say that that is a really valuable part of doing the award. And if you want to have a look at providers, the website here offers you a list of all 33 providers who are part of the provider partnership who undergo that quality assurance that um, Angela talked about at the beginning of the session. Um, so they're part of our organisation, Leading Learning for SEND Community Interest Company. So thank you for your attention. And thank you for those questions. And hopefully we have some other questions to challenge us with. Indeed, I have been uh, noting some questions down. So thank Fabulous. you for uh, the, the folks who've popped things on the question and answer um, format. And if you've, um, while we're talking here, if you, other things come to mind, then please add your, your thoughts and your questions to the, the pile that we've got. Um, so I've tried to kind of group one or two things, and um, there was a question that came in uh, regarding something that you talked about early on, Tristan, which is around the graduated approach. And in fact, graduated approach has has appeared um, several times in in um, as you, as you've woven your way through things. Um, and the question from from Kenny is. Um, worth explaining what the graduated approach looks like in your own setting what does that mean in relation or what does that mean in reality for the class teacher so um what should the graduated approach really mean to a class teacher how can they how can they recognize it and and do it and be part of it is i think what kenny's kind of hoping to tease out here that's yeah that's a really interesting question so i guess kenny first i need to say um I would point you to the recording if it's not yet available, it will soon be of that graduated approach webinar. Um, but I think, you know, I think we need to start at that principle that it can be easy for us to think this worked before. So it's going to work now and it's going to work. This worked for this pupil who had a same label. So I'm going to put this in place for this pupil who had the same label, who has a similar label. And I think so then for the class teacher, it's thinking, OK, let's really assess carefully. And that will mean that there might be it might be about questioning where your information is coming from. So assessment can be really wide. Um, and making and I guess the next step is that planning where we want to be smart about our planning. Um, so that needs to be considered. And I guess it's about consideredness. So we're getting through to that planning, assess plan, then doing, do we know that we're doing it? And that's where, um, you know, we're busy in a classroom and there's all sorts of things going on. 
at the moment bubbling. If it wasn't this year, last year, it would be rehearsals for the end of term play or whatever it is. And are we actually doing the provision that we plan for? So there's something about that monitoring that would be the class teacher would be expected to do about did they get their sessions on this or did they have that focus teaching that we were thinking they needed or did they have that pre-learning? So there's something about them monitoring what goes on um, in that busy classroom life. Mm. And then I think it's that stepping in of the Senko at the review process and it's helping them to be a reflective practitioner. So for me, it's embedded within this notion of being a reflective practitioner and it's enacting reflective practice. Um, and for the Senko, I think in a, where I would, as a Senko, where I would like it to be in, in my setting would be that I was supporting that reflective practice. So I came in at the review stage to say, okay, talk to me about what you planned why you planned that, what the assessment was, did it happen? And then I can help you, I can coach you in a way through that review process to think, have we got somewhere? Was it good? Were those targets appropriate? Did you, were you over ambitious, but look at that progress, let's keep going. Um, so I think it's about just really embodying that reflective and it's giving a framework through which to be a reflective practitioner. And I guess it links Tristan to your, a very sort of powerful reminder that um, in, in, in the code 6, 636, I think you, you had it, that teachers are responsible. Um, so there, there is something there, as you say, about, about teachers being empowered to, to, to be in the lead yeah. with the graduated approach. And that's perhaps the Senko role to empower that to happen. And, and I think that makes me think also about the relationship with um, maybe a teaching assistant who's working closely with a young person and um, what we know, uh, what we can take from publications about the work of teaching assistants, um, Webster and Blatchford's work um, around that it only only work provision provided by teaching assistants is only really effective if there is a good partnership. That's what I take away between the teacher and the TA. And that's what I take away from um, the nitty gritty within um, Blatchford and Webster's work. Because there were headlines about that that made us all sit up when headlines were thrown out that TA support is inefficient and doesn't work. But actually that isn't the nitty gritty conclusion that they came to. Mm. And so I think, again, if we're open and we've got that framework that can be shared with the people we work with as well. So it makes for good teamwork. And it's not something that we just do. If we consciously go through those, you know, we often talk about how boundaries and routines can support young people. And I think they support us as well if we use the right ones effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. I'm, ho I'm hoping that that works as a, as a, a way to really deepen those thoughts um, on, on that one, Kenny. That's great. Um, so there's some interesting questions just, just coming up on the aspect of outcomes. Um, and obviously the code is, is, is locked into this notion of outcomes. So we've had a couple of questions about um, the language of expected outcomes. And then that reference that, that you've made to, to kind of underpinning targets. So can you talk through a couple of questions coming from a couple of different people? Can you call, talk through um, whether there's a difference between targets and outcomes? Is that something to be reconciled given that the code is really outcomes focused? How, how would you how would you sit those two words? Yeah, that's that's really that's an interesting challenge there so i would yeah, obviously it's going to be a wednesday afternoon challenge it is it is um so i think i guess the language of outcomes is really clear what are the outcomes for this young person from this um although having said that that's really clear our outcomes can be long term and they can be short term um so i think when for me and I, I'm ready to be challenged on this. Targets are more short term. Targets are limited and that we can have short term and long term outcomes. And our targets, we're saying this is what we're putting in place. 
And this is the behavior in whatever, in that broadest sense that we're expecting to see. Because if we're looking at targets, that's very measurable language. Um, so we're going to say, I'm putting in this provision in order that the young person I'm working with can reach this point, can do this behavior. And that might be that they can um, attend to um, a, a lesson for 15 minutes without reminder. It might be that they can achieve um, X grade in a test. So we can have all of those sort of very defined targets. And then for me, the outcome is perhaps something a little bit larger. Um, and is the outcome, I guess on our provision map, it could be that the target was met and that was the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, however, we might be looking, when we're going into the language um, that we might use in EHCPs, in education and healthcare plans, then we're looking at perhaps wider outcomes. So we've got that whole, um, strand of outcomes for later life and adulthood if we're working particularly with the 16 to 25 year olds so i i'm i'm slightly challenged by that question um because i think that it's there's a mix of language there mm -hmm. but i would say that if we're thinking in terms of provision map my outcomes would be how far have i got towards that target and could just to extend the the challenge that's obviously been 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 captured by by a couple of people who've who've raised this, um, sh the the outcomes and or the targets on a provision map should those reflect the embedding of that learning back in the classroom as being success that the success that's being looked for. So that is great. You know, that's what we want to aim for is where I would jump in at, at that. So we can say, you know, we can set a target that this person can use um, finger spaces, for example, in their writing. Um, but I think when we're setting those smart targets, when we're targeting, we need to be clear. Is that when they're doing that with support? Is that in their everyday piece of writing? So I think it's about being explicit there with how are we going to assess those targets? Um, so when we're setting those targets, it's saying that. Um, so we don't think, how can I, you know, as we're setting those targets, how can I assess those targets? So I think ideally that is what we want to do. We'd want to say that we're going to assess those targets within an, that learning situation or that producing situation that those young people are doing not within that context of um, that intervention so that's difficult so if we're working on a program um, a programmed intervention that we're using which will have checklists and things like that then that's the first stage and I think we could stage that in terms of target so we'd be thinking okay so if they're doing x program they will score 80 percent or more on on that area of development and then the next stage will be okay how do we make sure that's integrated into their whole learning so that that is then talking in terms of monitoring and managing the provision is that saying that we're not satisfied with situation specific learning if that's not a full outcome or not a fully achieved target we're actually looking for it to be used and embedded and and that you could stage that within almost the language of targets yes yeah i think that's a lovely example isn't it so we've got the outcome that we want them to be able to use appropriate spacing in their writing target one is to use finger spaces with you know they're setting in a particular context where we've got a program set up and then we're saying next it will be to use that in their creative writing activity and we're going to look at that and how we're going to support them to do that and do we have some resources so yeah that staged approach is often supports us if we're doing um if we're going down the route of a particular intervention to help with a very fine particular skill mm -hmm. let me just check if i'm 
with with some very very full answers and lots of good illustrations there i'm hoping that that does answer the questions and if if you want more just pop it in the in the chat bar yeah. we'll 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 draw a little dotty line under that one um and then just have a look at one or two other areas but do come back to tristan because he's clearly enjoying this challenge that's great <laughs> okay um so a question from sean um just looking at the um no not from sean i apologize from ashley um can SLT be part of the provision? Um, because, well, you know, should they be explicit? I, I guess, Ashley, you're asking, should they kind of be explicitly expected to be seen as part of the provision? You know, when you went through all of those those people who yeah. were, and those things that were part of provision. So I guess the, the, the succinct answer to that is if we're planning that the SLT are going to have a particular role with an individual or a group of young people, then yes. So if we're thinking they go, um, let's say, um, when they reach X thing, they get to go and see the head teacher for a celebration award, then mm. I think, yes, that is a provision. Now, I wouldn't cost that because they're not actually, I, I would say that's part of the role. It's not something. But if you were saying that the SLT would need to come and spend 20 minutes a week with them um, doing something, then I think there's there's a case to be made to cost that on the provision map. Mm -hmm. um, if, if it's ad hoc, then I wouldn't. So I, I'd make that rule of thumb about whether it's planned for and regular. Okay. Yeah, hoping that that answers that question. And thank you. Um, just looking at costing, is there ever a, a justification for costing provision maps in terms of time as well as money? So, for example, the time that is actually being taken up for the child or young person because they're potentially out of the class. So costing for time, does that have any any value at all? I need to um, I'm not quite understanding the context of that. Um... I think I think what's what's the, what the thinking there is that if we are looking at how many hours per, let's say, half term yeah. something is being given to a child, it's therefore taking that child's time. And if it's time costed and what we see is that that intervention hasn't been perhaps as effective, then that child isn't going to get the time back again. So in terms of monitoring and managing and being able to have, as you said, that good review, is there ever a place not only to money cost it, but to factor in how much of the child's life it's just taken up and, and perhaps what they've missed in the classroom? Uh, yeah, that's that's. So I guess that you will have that mm. on the provision map. So if you're thinking they're you will have the information that you can glean to make that decision. So you're thinking, and there, there's a case there, I guess, to be if you are mapping intervention that is taking place, let's say during PE, um, it, it could be quite useful to put on your provision map that they are doing 30 minutes twice a day with a one-to-one -one at PE time. Mm. So that then when you go back to talk about the effectiveness of that provision for that child, if you're in one of those assessment meetings, um, which, again, I would say as a SENCO, it's really useful to be in those. Um, what the, the, There's another terminology that tends to be used um, for those meetings, those the sort of pupil progress meetings. Yes, those yeah. pupil progress meetings. Yeah. And again, I have found that many SENCOs are involved in those. So it's not just an SLT member who does that and the assessment lead. If the SENCO is involved in those, that can be really, really useful and feed into that provision mapping. And the provision mapping can feed into that um, conversation. You've then got that information. Think, oh, yeah. So what are they getting? They're getting 30 minutes. All oh, but it is in their PE time. Mm. Now, you can't get that time back. But you can say, right, why did we choose this? If you're doing that assess, plan, do review process and you're not doing that on your own as a teacher, then you can have those challenges about, oh, so why have you chosen PE for them to miss? Mm -hmm. Or why is it assembly? Why is that less important to them than this, this development? So it, it 
it's those informed choices um, because we are making compromises. Mm. And presumably that can then, if, if you're adding the voice of the young person in that, if PE is, only thing, is the only thing they live for. Yeah. Then, so, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a really good case for that voice of the child. Or if they really don't like it, you know, conversely. Um, and, and that's an area that, yeah. So that's really useful. And th there's another challenge for us there. How do we get that voice of the young person into, for example, those pupil progress and meetings mm. and i've found really interesting um ways of doing that in terms of before a pupil progress meeting having a pupil progress conference mm. with mm. the young people mm. Mm. absolutely so just thinking of meetings for a moment petra's asked um is it good practice to link annual review outcomes with interventions as part of the provision map So it's useful to, if you are going down the route of particular interventions, it's quite useful to be able to say this is an intervention that we've put in place that is working or mm. has worked. But I don't think, A, I don't think that's always possible. And B, I think that annual review meetings tend to take a larger outlook. Mm. Um, you know, we're looking at considering their where we want what outcomes we want for the next few years mm. or the next key stage transition um mm. so i think that would be a big ask and i don't think it's necessary um to say that those interventions if we've got good reviewing going on and good monitoring by whoever's running if we're running interventions mm. that we can pull on that information before the intervention is finished Okay, that's good. So we've had some really nice contributions just while we've been talking. Um, Jane has just said that uh, she's asked the teachers in her school to make what they call intervention timetables, which uh, are weekly, um, kind of a timetable overview. Um, and that's for the class. So I guess, Jane, that gives really good teacher ownership, um, but also individual provision maps for each child with SCN. Is, is, is that reasonable, says Jane? <laughs> I think that's by negotiation. You've got to arbitrate here. Is that reasonable? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you know, um, I was talking to a practitioner recently who's got 20 children in their class who are on their SCN register. Some yeah. people might say, well, maybe they're inappropriately placed. Some people might say, um, oh, well, you've got a high incidence of SCN. Yeah. Now, that might you might then start to consider is that reasonable for them to make individual provision maps? So so I guess it's by, um, I'm not going to say negotiation, by agreement, um, by, um, and how useful is it? You know, and again, I think that's a really useful, a really important rule of thumb. What I'm doing, what, I, what paperwork I'm doing, how useful is it? Is it useful as a thinking tool? Is it useful as an accountability tool? Is it useful as a review tool? If it's not going to be really useful, and if it's only for accountability, it might be that we can consider rationalising it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. OK, so that's that's back uh, back to you then, to, Jane, to have a <laughs> have a little. Thing yeah, not going to give you an easy yeah. answer. <laughs> is it reasonable and is it making a difference, I suppose? is, is Yeah. Uh, good um code of practice talks talks about high quality teaching um just to mention uh, obviously we've used you've used the language of quality first teaching high quality teaching kind of combined um kenny asks the definition of oh, here you go you've got you got 10 seconds to do this Tristan. kenny asks uh, what's your definition of quality first teaching um and myra asks what's the difference between quality first teaching and high quality teaching so my understanding um, is that or what I think the understanding of quality first teaching is that whole class event that goes on um, where um, teaching is that delivery part um, that's what I would say is the assumption of quality first teaching whereas high quality teaching I think is all of it in a way and I think it's a nice term in that for some we people might feel that quality first teaching isn't the way that they work that they don't do that whole class input like that um, so if they've got approaches um, and they might follow the 
old fashioned approaches of carouseling or whatever it is um, and bringing together and working on a plenary, um, then that won't necessarily have that quality first teaching. So then perhaps, you know, I, maybe my choice of terminology could have been better and I should have been talking about high quality teaching. And I guess the grey area there is that one could argue that high quality teaching is any of that educational experience um, that is planned for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, I would, uh, yeah, questioning my own terminology there. OK, so that's a, a grand question that's <laughs> sent, sent lots of thoughts um, uh, sort of into the arena, which is, is great. Can I just read out what um, what Ashling has has popped in here as well? Um, Ashling says, uh, considering asking teachers uh, to create a provision map for a child they have um, for whom they have SEN concerns so that they can use the graduated approach with me before um, you know, moving things on to an EHCP point. It also gives them a chance to see what we have put in place for the child and where we can go from there. So does that sound, there was a question mark at the end there, Ashling. So I think that's, that's just testing out that and just checking that that feels right in terms of practice. Yeah, so I guess what we're thinking, we've got somebody who they've identified and they are, I guess, does that mean that they are on the SEN, the SEN register for uh, SEN support? And I think using the graduated, so that the teacher yeah. can implement the graduated approach as SPAN do review, yeah. And so if we think that an individual provision map can support somebody through that assess plan do review process, then mm. again, that is quite a useful tool. Mm. Um, Although I guess the assess element wouldn't figure massively on a provision map because it's more focused on the plan, do and review. Yeah. So I think there's something there about supporting and ensuring that that assessment is as holistic as it can be. Yeah. Um, but then thinking, OK, um, does having a, a um, a set of boxes or however it might be in terms of provision map does that support them to really identify um, and have a good overview for everything that's going in place for that young person mm -hmm. I think it can be a really useful tool mm -hmm. so again it goes back to that I guess if you think it's useful then put it in place have a try maybe suggest to that teacher look I'm thinking that this might be a really useful planning tool for people and it would help when I come to you and say I'm updating the um, provision map can you give me your information so I'm thinking that this might help you in that and then help you in terms of planning for your provision mm -hmm. so would you be happy to try an individual provision map for those young people who we feel we might be moving up on the um, SEN level mm -hmm. and it gives us good evidence if that's a way it gives us good evidence then to put towards our evidence for um, an education healthcare plan absolutely excellent so three more quick comments just mindful um, of of timing for the session uh, a couple of people have said it would be really lovely to see some examples of provision maps but that as we know there isn't a perfect one out there i think is what you said but but certainly um julie has said uh, examples would be would be great um john said do you have written examples that we could look at i think they would be useful as a resource so just if you hold that thought for a moment tristan um, and then Myra, I'm not quite sure if we're going to be able to manage this one. You've just said, I've been on the SEND in a nutshell. Should this information slash data be on the provision map? Um, but unless Tristan can translate that, not sure quite what the information you are talking no, about. No, I'm is. not familiar with SEND <laughs> yeah. in a nutshell. So that's yeah. a challenging one for me. Yeah. Um, so going back to that question about can you know examples i think there's a difficult thing to that's a difficult thing in that there are commercially available ones mm. so then if an organization starts to recommend particular provision maps that becomes quite um a difficult situation mm. um and but also i'll go back to the thing that it's what works for you so what I would suggest, I, I might have already said this, but is going to your network saying what works for you. Um, you know, I did that in our last um, National Senko Award cohort when we were talking about provision maps, was I asked everyone to bring in what they use. Mm. 
-hmm. and some came in with a blank piece of paper because they weren't at a position where they were doing provision maps and others brought in a printout from their commercially available and then people started to say oh yeah that works for me no that wouldn't work for me in my setting um, because we have to do everything using this system mm -hmm. and then i think if you're interested in um, an online provision map i would sort of go to some of the providers and say okay show me what you've got mm -hmm. sell it to me mm -hmm. um yeah so the short answer is i i wouldn't be in a position to give those and the long answer i've given <laughs> excellent so finally um a, a, a comment from maria who just says um returning to SC, the scn uh, sorry returning to the senko role in january this has been invaluable Thank you very much, Maria. That's great to hear. Thanks. And well done and enjoy it. And if you're in control, you can make a difference. That's what I'm going back to. Excellent. OK, thank you, Tristan. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, everyone. Um, and do join us again for our next webinars. And I think, um, yeah, there's a few resources on the end of the slides there just that um, we referred to. and. Um, Again, if you want to look, there's an SEND review guide on, on the whole school SEND resource page, which might feed into that auditing process. So do have a look if you haven't already. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.